at the very beginning of the outline, the heading is the power of the blood covenant. I want to read to you a scripture that's actually not presented at this point, but it's Revelation 12, 11. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Um, I wanted to just start with that as a springboard because of the profound declaration that's made there. Anytime we want to move forward in the things of God, it's going to require commitment. Amen? It's going to require commitment. And people are always asking, how do I win in this life? How do I enter into the victorious life? How do I enter into the abundant life? How do I enter into the blessed life? This passage right here gives you the secret to that. This tells you how to be blessed. And the whole idea is that a full-fledged life commitment to God and the things of God based upon your testimony of His Word will cause you to begin to walk at a new level and in a new realm. Okay? This is a powerful scripture. If you want to be blessed, if you want to walk in the abundance of God, if you want to be an overcomer, if you want God's best promises to be manifest in your life, then you and I have to give God our very best in commitment. It says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Amen. You can begin to testify or decree what the blood is about concerning your life. And how do you do that? By declaring or testifying the word. What does the word say about the blood? And that's what we're going to look at today. Today we're going to probably read a little more scripture in class than we typically would, but uh, I encourage you to just hang with me in this. Beginning of our introduction here, it says, in order to fully understand the full scope and sequence of what the blood of Christ means to humanity, we must covenant, we must understand covenant from the biblical perspective. Hebrews 9, 7 helps us with this. But into the second went the high priest along once every year, not without blood. Can you say that? Not without blood? Which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Errors meaning, of course, sins. Sin means to miss the mark. It's an error, amen. The scripture is saying to us that the high priest under the old covenant, and it's still the same today, had to present blood in order for there to be remission, in order there's, in the Old Covenant for there to be a moving forward of sin. Under the New Covenant, Jesus, as you know, was the ultimate sacrifice, amen? He fully and wholly gave his life that we might be redeemed, amen? And so the idea I want you to have stick in your mind here is that not without blood. Uh, today we have a very unusual and unique situation going on. And it's a departure of the blood in the church. My nephew uh, was a worship leader at a very large church up until two weeks ago in the Dallas Metroplex area. And he resigned. And he resigned his position because he was instructed by the senior staff over him that he was not allowed to sing any more songs that contained the word blood. We're talking about a major influencing church in the Metroplex. So he resigned. Um, and I don't know what he'll do next, but he'll, he'll, he'll always find something to do. But my point is, is that we've got to make a decision as to what we know and understand and believe. And then we've got to stand on that principle, on that belief and on that faith. And to be perfectly honest with you, we read a scripture here from uh, Hebrews 9, 7 that says not without blood. If there is no blood, there is no redemption. If there is no blood, there is no healing. If there is no blood, there is no salvation. If there is no blood, there is no deliverance. Amen? If Jesus went to the cross but didn't actually shed his blood on the cross like Muslims declare he did. You know that Islam believes that Jesus was a great prophet. They believe he went to the cross, but he was secretly taken off the cross and Judas was put on the cross. That's what they believe. So they believe that, that the death on the cross was actually not Christ himself. And if that were true, then there would be no redemption and no salvation for mankind. We've got to embrace and hold on to this truth about the blood of Jesus. 
Don't be ashamed of it. Political correctness today says that it's too gross task. The political correctness today says that speaking of the blood, that showing the blood is not um, apropos anymore. Yet the very same people make their money off of movies where blood and all kinds of uh, just filth and, and destruction and, and murder uh, they, they're all about that. But in religion, you can't talk about the blood. Why do we allow people to influence the church who themselves have no relationship with Christ? They have no professed, many times, no religion at all, or if a religion, certainly it's often not a Christian. It's not Christian. So we've got to stand on this concept of the blood. One of the reasons I chose to bring this course this year was because I want to stand against this assault on the blood of Jesus Christ, amen. Scripture says in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. What is the soul? The soul is the mind, will, and emotions. But the soul also has to do with the fleshly choices and decisions we make, amen. And we know that sin we are born into this world under what we call original sin. That means that we inherited that uh, sin nature from our father Adam and our mother Eve. But we also know that sin is acts, actions, deeds committed against the will of God or the desires of God. James put it this way. He said, uh, if a man knows to do good and he does it not to him, it is sin. So we can see right there that sin originates and takes place as a choice or a decision in the soulish realm. Are you with me? God said the life of the flesh is in the blood. He said, I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. I want to tell you what will kill the flesh and will destroy the soul faster than anything. It's called sin. Amen. God told Adam and Eve that in the garden. He said, if you, if you partake of this one tree, he said, you will surely die. Amen? What happened? They made a decision to partake of the fruit of that tree. They made a soulish choice to enter into an act of sin that produced death. James said also that when temptation comes, that the very thought, when it is conceived, in other words, when it takes place, it brings death. Amen? But where does it start? It always starts right here. It always starts in the soulish realm. So what happens when blood is applied, blood washes and cleanses the, the act of sin that was committed against God. So life is definitely in the flesh. We know that. Many of you guys are hunters. Many are, uh, we've, some of our students in this very class are in the woods this morning instead of here. And that's fine. But uh, they are out there, and their objective is to take the life of that deer so that they themselves might consume it for their own purposes, whatever that may be. Well, that's what the devil is about. The devil wants your blood. The devil wants the blood of Jesus Christ. What he wants to take away from you is the life that is resident in you. And if he can steal the blood, for example, from the church, if the church won't preach about the blood anymore, if the church won't teach about the blood, if the church can't sing choruses and worship songs and hymns about the blood anymore, what is the devil accomplishing? He's taking the life out of the church. Amen? And you and I are those who stand in leadership roles and positions throughout this metroplex. We are influencers. We must declare and insist that the blood be preached, that the blood be sung about. We must declare and insist that our people are indoctrinated, taught, they are educated about the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Revelation 5, 9, it's not in your notes, but it says, With your blood you have purchased man for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. So God has declared and the scriptures have declared, we could say also that John on Patmos declared that it was the blood of Christ 
that has purchased every man, woman, and child since the garden all the way to the future. Hello? It was the blood of Jesus. We cannot discount the blood of Jesus. We cannot in any way minimize the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus that purchased your soul. It is the blood of Jesus that purchased the souls of the nations. Can I, can I get an amen right there? Amen. I'm going to India Thursday. I'm going to India because the blood of Jesus has purchased souls of the nation, in the nation of India. I'm going there because there's something valuable that has been invested in them. That from before the foundation of the world, God declared that India should be saved. And so with that, God calls men and women to go to the nations of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're talking about the blood of Jesus, all right? Amen. He says, uh, Hebrews 9, verses 1 through 15, it's a little bit lengthy passage. I'm going to be reading to you here, but I want to use this as a springboard to carry her further into this. Hello, people. Welcome. Blessed to have you here today. Um, during the break, I will, let me ask Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie, would you ask Rick if we have any more tables, please? Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, um, Hebrews 9, 1 through 15. Let's read this. For those of you that just joined us, we want to welcome you. If you need to get on the internet to view the course, you can do that at this address right here. The first one is the internet. Uh, the, it's our internet. And then the second one's the password. Okay? And you can go there. Um, when you want to take care of tuition or something, you go to the window back there, and then she can show you how to pull up your course on your Internet, like your smartphone or what have you, um, or she can actually email it to you, okay? All right, so Hebrews 9, 1 through 15. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. I'll try to read slowly here so we can take this in. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the gold pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory, showing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But in the second went the high priest along once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the same then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances, imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So we just read this foundational text here. And just to kind of sum this whole thing up, let me just say quickly that it, first it begins to paint the picture of the Old Covenant. And it describes the worship in the tabernacle and, and how it was... Uh, presented and taken care of. The problem was is that it wasn't a complete cleansing of the conscience. It didn't fulfill to the furthest end what was needed because the sacrifice was a sacrifice of animals. 
and we are human beings. Everybody say, I'm a human. <laughs> right. We're human beings. So God says to temporarily uh, appease me, why don't we do this? He says, you'll sacrifice animals and we'll just move your sin forward a year. The concept was to keep moving it or rolling it forward so that one day the ultimate Lamb of God who was spotless and without sin would come. And in that day, when that sacrifice was made, which it was on Calvary, it would be a once and for all ultimate cleansing and washing. So the old covenant was an, a satisfactory but not a completely sufficient way of satisfying God's need and man's need, better said, for redemption. And then uh, the new covenant we know was ratified, of course, through Jesus Christ and his blood on the cross. So that's what we've just read about here. And it kind of gives us the picture of this whole idea of covenant. And you'll see when you study the covenants this month in the back part of this manual that all covenants have certain requirements certain elements that must be present in order for a covenant to be in effect. And one that stands out in all covenants is there must be blood. That's why, as we began this morning, we said there's got to be blood. You cannot hide the blood. You cannot try to avoid the blood. You cannot put off or out the blood. The blood of Jesus, we read in the scripture right here, not without blood. There is no forgiveness without blood. There is no salvation without blood. Amen? Medical doctor and theologian M.R. Dehan said this. He said, the Bible is a book of blood, wholly distinct from all other books for just one reason, namely that it contains blood circulating through every page and in every verse. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the stream of blood. So Dr. Dehan was right about that. The Bible is a bloody book. And let's don't think for one minute that the reason there's such an assault against the blood or speaking the blood or preaching about the blood or singing about the blood that it's not orchestrated of the devil. God wants the blood declared. He wants the blood understood and he wants the blood valued and appreciated because it was the ultimate sacrifice, it was the ultimate price which he himself required, and no other, I don't mean just no other man, no other, period, could offer or provide that blood but his own son, Jesus Christ. And you know that. So from the first verse of the Bible to the very end, we see a trail of blood that makes its way or snakes its way through the pages. It reveals a portrait of the redemption that is available to all of us who come to God by faith. What are you putting your faith in? You're putting your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, amen? But you're also putting your faith in what Christ did. You're believing in His blood that was shed, amen? You've got to believe that. You've got to believe that He is the Son of God. Remember, we said that Muslims say that Jesus was a great prophet. Uh, the Mormons acknowledge Jesus in some concept or in some way, but, but these religions, many other religions don't specify the reality of who he is and all that he did. It's not only who he is, but it's also what he gave and what he did that redeems mankind, amen. The passage of scripture that we just read uh, in Hebrews there speaks particularly about the blood. Verse 1 through 11 focuses on the Old Testament sacrificial system. They speak of a time when millions of gallons of blood was shed to cover the sins of the people. Yet sin was only covered over year by year. All those millions of gallons of animal blood never saved a single soul. But the blood of bulls, goats, and lambs could not do it. The blood of Jesus accomplished. Amen? Amen. Do you understand the picture that, what, that went on every year? Every year when the, uh, the, the high priest would come and the people would come and bring their sacrifices, we're talking about anywhere from one and a half to four million people. That represents a lot of families. That represents a lot of animals. Are you with me? We're talking about thousands and thousands of animals. We're not talking about one animal offered on the sacrifice and, oh, we had a nice Sunday morning service and we got out in an hour. No. Listen, this was a mass killing. It was a bloodbath. 
We're talking about blood flowing on the ground. We're not talking about just, uh, uh, you know, just a drop here and a drop there. We're talking about literally thousands of animals offered on the altar. If you could see the priest in his priestly robes and, and you could picture how glorious they were when he came to the tabernacle and then picture when the day had come to an end. When all the sacrifices had been offered, you know what the priest looked like? He'd been bathed in blood. Blood would cover him. Think about it for a minute. We don't realize the amount of sacrifice that was given to cover the sins of the people. We don't realize the, 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 the hard work. We don't realize the effort that went into that. And then Jesus comes and he suffers and he's in agony, and he is, he's ridiculed, and he's humiliated, and he suffers, and he breathes his last breath on the cross. Jesus, having suffered and shed his blood seven times for you and me, for the sins of the world. Do you know the scripture says that uh, in the prophet Isaiah that, that his visage, in other words, that means his appearance, was so marred that he was unrecognizable. We see pictures that have particularly been depicted uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages and up by the Catholic Church, and we thank them for what they offer us, but most of these pictures are very inadequate. Number one, Jesus wasn't a very skinny, frail, weak-looking man. Jesus would have had to have been by virtue of his, his uh, vocation and, and just life in general in those days. He would have had to have been somewhat robust, somewhat at least strong. Um, not only that, we see them and usually there'll be a trickle of blood down the side and a drop of blood in each hand and maybe two drops of blood on the feet. It's not a correct picture. The scripture says you couldn't recognize him. We might be closer to describing what he looked like on the cross if we said it was, appeared to be a, a, a big side of beef. I want you to think about this for a minute. It takes a lot to cover man's sin. Somebody's got to suffer terribly for it. And Jesus took your suffering and my suffering. He took the sins of the world upon him. Can you imagine the pressure in his soul? Think about how, how depressing. Think about how uh, condemning, how, how heavy guilt is when you or I realize we've missed the mark, we've sinned. Think about it. Now think about that times millions and billions of people. That's the weight and the pressure the Son of God felt on that cross as he bore the sins of the world. I'm talking about on the inside of him. On the outside, we've already described, he was totally destroyed. On the inside, he's feeling this pressure and this burden of all of our sins. My God's good, isn't he? He's so good. So we thank God for the blood of Jesus, amen. There's seven times, that's not in your notes, but if you want to just jot these down, it'll be easy, that the blood of Jesus was shed. This is important because in Leviticus, it speaks of the sevenfold sprinkling, which is the, uh, it's a prediction or a foreshadow of the blood of Jesus. In other words, there are what we call types and shadows under the old covenant in the law. All of these things all spoke of and pointed us toward a future time, which would obviously be mostly manifest or accomplished through the life and body of Christ. So it's a prediction or a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ. And there are seven examples where this is fulfilled. Uh, it was actually presented in, I said Leviticus 16, and it's given in the ceremony of atonement. Atonement just means that one month. It means uh, basically to uh, take, care of, take care of the problem, to appease. Uh, people often say at one month. In other words, at one time it was all done. It was a final and ultimate sacrifice that Jesus would bring. Number one is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the scripture says he sweat great drops of blood. So that's the first time we see the sevenfold um, foreshadowing taking place here. The second one is when the soldiers came and they took him. The scripture says they beat him with rods and he bled. Okay? 
We see him shedding blood there. The third time, at some point, they plucked his beard and he bled again. Those of you that have any facial hair, you know what it hurts to just, to just get one caught on something. <laughs> it hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine somebody picking them out, all, all your hair? Here's number four. He was handed over by Pontius Pilate to be scourged. And the Romans' whip that was used to, to do the scourging, uh, we know historically had many thongs, and embedded in them were pieces of stone and metal. And I believe this is where a lot of the appearance of, well, not to be too graphic, but almost hamburger meat uh, was actually imposed upon him. If you can picture this whip with these thongs as it would lay across the flesh and then be jerked back, the metal and the stone would grab into the flesh it wasn't just like whipping someone and leaving a stripe, which is painful enough and can cause blood. This was an actual gripping of the flesh and then pulling it back, and it would just literally peel and tear the flesh deep into the muscle tissue. I know it's graphic, but we need to understand what Christ suffered and why he died uh, the way he did because he was paying that ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Here's number five, and that was the crown of thorns. This is when they beat him, and then they pressed into his skull this crown of thorns. If you've ever been to Israel, or you may have seen pictures of the thorns that were used for this during this time period. They still have these thorns uh, there. These thorns are very long, very strong and thick and sharp as a needle. They're woven into a crown and then pressed down onto the head. And, of course, you know, sometimes the pictures will show some trickles of blood, but I've got a feeling it was more than that. Uh, the pain. Do you know, the head is one of the places on the body that tends to bleed out the most when it is penetrated, if you've ever busted your head. One time when our children were young, we actually were pastoring in, out in West Texas, and we, had, uh, uh, we were pastoring out of church, and we were there for a while and felt like the Lord was moving us back east. And so we actually resigned and moved, and we were in a denomination at that time. And in that denomination, they voted on everything. So they had to vote on my resignation, which I thought was ridiculous, but I didn't tell them that. And they voted unanimously not to let me resign. And I thought, well, I'm going anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, I appreciated the sentiment, but it was silly to me. Uh, but they came back and they said, look, if you'll just come down here on the weekend and preach to us Sunday morning, and Sunday night, then you can go back and spend your week wherever you want to be. They paid me full salary. They had a nice, the parsonage was actually bigger than the church. It was a tiny church. But uh, they left the parsonage for us. They put some beds in there because we took ours with us. And we would drive six hours every weekend to, uh, well, I was going to college. And uh, I was going to a college. And so we moved over for me to return to college. Anyway, so um, we would drive back on Saturday. I'd preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then we would get home. Usually it was 3 o'clock, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning. Every weekend. We did it for six months, and finally we were so tired and exhausted, we just said, listen, we love you all, we appreciate it, but we can't do this anymore. And so we've eventually left, and the very next Sunday we end up preaching somewhere else, and they, those people asked us to take that church. So we didn't even miss a Sunday without a church. It was all in the timing of God. What I'm telling you about this, though, is um, that how easily the head bleeds. Our, we 